speaker this evening is Ray Hewitt. Uh, if you're from Medina, you probably already recognize him from a wonderful keynote address uh, at Spring Grove Cemetery for this year's Memorial Day uh, program. Uh, Ray is a U.S. Army veteran. Uh, he served from 1968 to 1971. Uh, when he joined, he was handpicked for a, an assignment to Dachau, Germany uh, with the 51st Military Police Detachment. Uh, he was there for 13 months. We'll hear about some of his experiences this evening. Uh, in addition to his Army service, uh, Ray continues to serve. He is Captain of the Honor Guard for American Legion Post 202. We are honored and delighted to have him with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming Ray Hewitt. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's, uh, it's a real honor for me to be here tonight uh, to, uh, to chat with you and talk with you about what I experienced and what I saw over when I, in Germany when I was at Dachau. Uh, don't let people tell you that the Holocaust didn't happen, because it did. I saw it all. And I have pictures at the end of this presentation to show you that uh, they were taken with an Instamatic camera, not like the cameras we have today. These are those little square cameras, and I tried to do the best I could, but some of the pictures were taken illegally because I wanted to have them for my memories, but uh, I managed to get them. <clears throat> I want to begin with a comment I made during my Memorial Day speech that I was honored to give at Spring Grove Cemetery. They all have stories to tell. The crosses at Normandy, the tombs at Arlington, the granite headstones <clears throat> at the Western Reserve National Cemetery in Seville. Living veterans, like all you veterans out here, you all have stories to tell as well. But today is a day to tell stories, and this is my story. My story about service in the US Army and what I experienced had a profound effect on me throughout my life. My story reminded us of what we are and why we serve, why we fight, and why we should always remember. I went into the Army in March of 68 during the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, and I was assigned to the 51st Military Police Detachment in Germany. When I arrived in Germany, I was handpicked, along with six or seven other military police, for a special duty assignment. <clears throat> we were put on a train at midnight, and we headed south from Frankfurt. And so I asked, where are we going? They just told me, you'll know when you get there. And again, about an hour or so later, I asked again, where are we going? And again, the answer was the same. You'll know when you get there. So I stopped asking. We arrived at the infamous World War II town of Dachau, Germany around midnight. We caught some sleep, and the next morning we were taken to the military complex located inside the former Nazi concentration camp. I saw it all. I saw the crematorium, the hanging posts where Hitler's guards hung prisoners, holes in the walls where prisoners were shot, and the wooden whipping tables where prisoners were beaten until they talked or submitted to their injuries, and it was just unbelievable. I kept out many of the details about Dachau in my Memorial Day speech because of the requirement for brevity and the young audience in front of me, scouts, the Medina High School Band, and the combined middle school bands. But tonight, I want to give you more details about Dachau, starting with the Nazi movement that spawned the concentration camps in the 30s and the details about the very first Nazi concentration camp which was Dachau. It was the very first one. Hitler's rise to power. Adolf Hitler, his rise to power began in Germany in September 1919 when Hitler joined the political party known as the German Workers' Party. The name was changed in 1920 to the National Socialist Workers' Party, commonly known as the Nazi Party. This political party was formed and developed during the post-World War I era. It was anti-Marxist and it opposed to a democratic post-war government of the Weimar Republic, which was required by the Treaty of Versailles, but it was forced on the Germans to end World War I. Hitler's Nazi party advocated extreme nationalism and pan-Germanism, as well as a virulent anti-Semitism. 
Hitler's rise can be considered to have ended in March of 1933, after the Reichstag, or Germany's Congress and Parliament, adopted the Enabling Act of 1933 in that month. President Paul von Hindenburg had already appointed Hitler as president on January 30, 1933, after a series of parliamentary elections and associated backroom intrigues. The Enabling Act, which used ruthlessly and with authority, virtually assured that Hitler could thereafter constitutionally exercise dictatorial power without any legal objection. Hitler's rise to prominence and his power was aided in part by his willingness to use violence in advancing his political objectives and to recruit party members who were willing to do the same. Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, which means my struggle, introduced Hitler to a wider audience of Germans who felt disenfranchised over the restrictions of German nationalism brought on by the Treaty of Versailles. In the days before March 1933 elections, Nazi stormtroopers had unleashed a campaign of violence against the Communist Party in Germany, the KPD, the Trade Unionists, the Social Party of Germany, and the Center Party. In March of 1933, elections could be, would be the last multi-party elections in a unified Germany until 1990. In the months before the March 1933 elections, brown shirts and SS shock troops of the Hitler movement displayed terror, repression, and propaganda across the land. And Hitler's organization monitored the voting process. And in Prussia, 50,000 members of Hitler's support groups were ordered to monitor the votes acting as auxiliary police by the acting interior minister, Hermann Goring. Despite waging a campaign of terror against their opponents, the Nazis only trailed 43.9% of, oh, excuse me, only tallied 43.9% of the vote, well short of the majority. They needed the votes of the German Nations People's Party, the DNVP, which only polled 8.43% to put them over the top with a slim majority. Two weeks after the election, Hitler was able to pass an enabling act, previously mentioned with the support of all non-socialist parties, which effectively gave Hitler dictatorial powers. Within months, the Nazis banned all other parties and turned the Reichstag, Germany's equivalent of parliament or the Congress, into a rubber stamp legislature comprised only Nazis and pro-Nazi guests. Later, on August 2nd, 1934, Chancellor Paul von Hindenburg died, leaving Hitler as the sole ruler of Germany. The position of president which Hitler held was abandoned and he became the sole ruler. With absolute control on the government and German people, the die was cast for Adolf Hitler to take the world into darkness, a level that no one could conceive. On March 21st, 1933, the following announcement appeared in a Munich newspaper. On Wednesday, March 22nd, 1933, the first concentration camp will be opened in the vicinity of Dachau. It can accommodate 5,000 people. We have adopted this measure, undeterred by party scruples, in the conviction that our action will help and restore calm to the country and is in the best interest of our people. The edict was signed by Heinrich Himmler, Commissioner of Police for the city of Munich. Dachau is a little more than nine miles northwest of Munich. The main part of the camp served as a munitions factory during World War I. The camp was opened in March of 1933, but later, in 1938, the munitions part of the camp was torn down by prisoners to make more space for the increasing flow of prisoner categories identified by Hitler's Third Reich as World War II loomed on the horizon. Dachau was located in a former swamp. The camp area had a poor climate. It was moist and it was foggy. A true wasteland in more ways than one. The original prisoners in Dachau were communists, trade union leaders, social democrats, any group that would challenge Hitler's plans for absolute political control were placed there. Himmler supplied police officers and brown shirts from, from Munich to run the camp as a police officer in charge. 
The arrangement was soon to change with the appointment of Theodore Eich, a ruthless and fanatical Nazi who would establish at Dachau the sadistic norms to be used in all concentration camps of the Third Reich. Theodore Eich, who was, who was to rise to the rank of Lieutenant General in the SS, was the architect for the brutality of the German concentration camp system. He was the son of a station master, born in October 1892. He joined the army, German army, and during World War I was awarded the Iron Cross for bravery. In the post-war period, he became an inspector in a police organization and held various political and police jobs, all of which he lost because of his uncompromising hostility to the post-World War I German government at the time, the Weimar Republic. He joined the National Socialist German Workers' Party in 1928 and two years later took command of a political SS regiment. The SS units would become parliamentary units throughout the war. Suspected of carrying out bomb attacks on political opponents, Heinrich Himmler, another leader in the Workers' Party, advised Ike to go and live in Italy. He left and was subsequently sentenced to two years imprisonment in absentia. Ike returned to Germany after Adolf Hitler became into power, and he was considered ever suspicious, quarrelsome, cruel, humorless, and, afflict and afflicted with a cancerous ambition. He was a genuinely fanatic Nazi who had embraced the movement's political and radical ideology with zeal, advancing rapidly into the power structure of the Third Reich. His chief hallmark in the SS was an uncompromising ruthlessness in the service of obedience and a marked talent for organization. Even to Heinrich Himmler, Ike's rough, unstable character with violent and unruly behavior had given Himmler headaches. And after establishing Dachau, Himmler had found a backwater for his troublesome subordinate and he sent him there to run the camp. After arriving at Dachau, Ike would later recall, there were times when we had no coats, no boots, no socks. Men were using their own clothes on duty. The attitude from above was that guards were required as a necessary evil that cost money. Little men of no consequence standing guard behind the barbed wire. At the beginning, there was not a single cartridge, not a single rifle, let alone machine guns. Only three of his men knew how to operate a machine gun. Some of the men were misfits that polluted the unit and they were sent from Munich to be rid of them for one reason or another. He had to contend with disloyalty, embezzlement, and corruption. Ike appealed to Heinrich Hemmler and received the support he requested. And he noted, from then on, progress was unimpeded. I sent to work unreservedly and joyfully. I trained soldiers as non-commissioned officers and some of the non-commissioned officers as leaders. We built an excellent discipline which produced an outstanding esprit de corps. We cast out from our ranks anyone who showed the least sign of disloyalty. From that point on, Ike increased the fanaticism of the prison guard system and the SS parliamentary units. While not all prison guards were SS, they would be the, quote, shock troops, unquote, of the prison system. One of the guards would later recall, I can clearly remember the first flogging that I witnessed. Ike had issued orders that a minimum of one company from a guard unit attend the infliction of three or these corporal punishments. Two prisoners who had stolen cigarettes from the canteen were sentenced to 25 lashes each with the whip. The troops under arms were formed up in an open square in the center of which stood the whipping block. Two prisoners were led forward by their block leaders. Then the commandant arrived. The commander of the protective custody compounded, compound and the senior company commander reported to him. The company commander read out the sentence and the first prisoner, who was a small malingerer, was made to lie along the length of the block. Two soldiers held his head and his hands, and two block leaders carried out the punishment, delivering alternative strokes, and the prisoner uttered no sound. The other prisoner, who was a professional politician of strong physique, 
behaved quite differently. He cried out at the very first stroke and tried to break free. He went on screaming to the end, although the commandant yelled at him to keep quiet. The soldier, started, the soldier was standing in the first rank and was compelled to watch the whole procedure. I say compelled because if he had been in the rear, he would not have looked. When the man began to scream, he went hot and cold all over. In fact, the whole thing, even the beating of the first prisoner, made him shudder. Later on at the beginning of the war, he attended his first execution, but it did not affect him nearly so much as witnessing his first corporal punishment. In May of 1934, Ike was given responsibility of reorganizing Germany's concentration camp system. One of his recommendations was that guards be warned that they would be punished if they showed prisoners any sign of humanity. Ike's personality, in particular his unremitting hatred for everything and everyone that was non-Nazi, influenced definitely the development, the structure, and the uniquely inhumane inhumane ethos of the concentration camps. Ike was convinced that the camps were the most effective instrument available for destroying the enemies of National Socialism. He regarded all prisoners as subhuman adversaries of the state, marked for immediate destruction if they offered the slightest resistance. Ike eventually succeeded in nurturing the same attitude among many of the SS guards in the camp. Like many of the concentration camp commanders he trained, Ike basically was pitiless and cruelly insensitive to human suffering and regarded qualities such as mercy and charity as useless, outmoded absurdities that could not be tolerated in the SS. The camp structure established under Ike was designed for maximum efficiency. The camp commandant, the commandant was responsible for ensuring Dachau carried out the expectations of Himmler and Ike, both in efficiency and the numbers of prisoners the camp could handle. Some, com some commandants were not at all interested in the affairs of the prisoners and gave full power to their deputies, the camp leaders. Others would periodically intervene with a demonstrated brutality to keep the organization on their toes. The last commandant, Commandant Weiss, was an exception, exception and forbade the deliberate beating of prisoners. When corporal punishment was ordered, he personally watched to ensure it was not abused. To preserve the prisoners' strength to work in the armaments industry, he allowed them to receive food parcels. His real intention was to keep them alive in the camp until the end. In the last phase of the war, Weiss became inspector of the concentration camps. Because he foresaw the complete collapse of Hitler's power, he did not permit the carrying out of Himmler's command to shell and burn the camp at Dachau together with all its inmates on the night of April 28th and 29th of 1945. Weiss was nonetheless sentenced to death by the Allies after the war because he signed and executed death sentences which, be, which came from Berlin. <clears throat> the camp leader was responsible for the numerical stability of the prisoners, for the criminal procedures in the camp and carrying out the daily programs in the years 1940 to 1942, the SS chief storm leader was camp leader and famous for his brutality. His merit to his superiors consisted in the severe punishment of prisoners without good reasons for insignificant transgress transgressions and without any, even the least possibility of defense or explanation. He particularly liked the punishment at the stake. In the camp, it was called the tree and the floggings with at least 25 lashes. One of the most important assistants of the camp leader was the report leader. He was responsible for the preparation of the reports on camp stability and executed the orders and regulations of the camp's leader. The report leader came into immediate contact with the prisoners and the prisoners usually referred to the report leader as the camp beasts. They took pleasure in playing tricks on the prisoners everywhere and on every occasion, beating, kicking, and the ill treatment of prisoners was part of their daily routine. To carry out the politics of the camp leaders and report leaders, they had the services of block leaders. And until 1940, block leaders were chosen from particular confidants of the SS. 
In the course of time, they were raised to the rank of officer and practiced and practiced the functions of the camp's leaders. Towards the end of 1944, they were replaced by Army non-commissioned officers who were largely unfit for service on the front lines. They had seen the hardship themselves, and they often made friends with the prisoners, especially when they received part of the content of food parcels. At the time, they were even opposed to the SS, since they were regular army. However, about 80% of these NOCs were zealous in their duties against the prisoners. The interrogation officer was subordinate to the camp leaders. He distinguished himself in this particular zeal and repeatedly demanded death sentences for the so-called sabotage, sab sabotages. But block secretaries were prisoners as well and were subjected to beatings by the SS for the smallest transgression. They were beaten in the face of other ways that were customary in the camp. Block secretaries tried to support their fellow prisoners in any way possible. Towards the end of the war, when things became difficult on the front lines, they gained influence because of the lack of help in the camps and used that influence to help save many prisoners as possible. The Dachau concentration camp was rectangular about 330 yards wide, 660 yards long. West of the camp, the SS personnel were quartered. I want you to pay particular attention to this picture right here, and I'll tell you why a little later. This picture right here, and that one on top. Okay, I, I will tell you why in just a little, little bit. The camp was rectangular, being about 330 yards wide and 660 yards long. West of the camp, the SS personnel were quartered. From their building, a wide asphalt street led to the prison camp. That's right here. That's what I want you to keep in mind, and that too. Okay? Known by prisoners as the turnpike to hell. The camp administration building, called the Jor House, was at the end of the street. The large iron gate in this building bore the inscription, Work Makes You Free. And that's located right there. Right in there, that's where the gate was. The upper floor of the administration building was occupied by SS authorities. The camp leader and his deputies, as well as officers of the Gestapo trial commissioner, the offices of the report leader and the guard room were on the ground floor. Adjacent offices, including large storerooms for the personal belongings of the prisoners. There was a large shower installation for about 150 people, a large kitchen with modern equipment, a cellar, laundry, and clothes store. From the Jor House, a street led to the bunker. This street was infamous. The prisoners often had to stand there for many hours in rainy weather, frost, and heat for the least violation of rules. Day after day, the dreaded morning and evening roll calls took place on this street, and corporal punishment was inflicted. From here, labor gangs marched away every day to work and returned in the evening. As Heinrich Himmler announced in 1933, the concentration camp at Dachau would be opened with a capacity to provide lodging for 5,000 prisoners. But after 1942, the number of prisoners was never less than 12,000. You can imagine how crowded it was. Communists, leading socialists, and other enemies of the state were the chief arrests in 1933. They erected more barracks and soon large transports of German Jews began to arrive at the camp. After a short term of imprisonment, most of them received permission to go overseas, especially when they, uh, they voluntarily gave all their property to ensure Hitler's public treasury. After the annexation of Austria and the conquest of Czechoslovakia, the citizens of these countries were, at the, were the next victims and prisoners of the concentration camp at Dachau. In 1940, large transports of Polish prisoners came to Dachau, and while the camp lasted, the Poles co constituted the largest number of prisoners. There were also large and small groups of other nationalities as well. On April 26, 1945, the Dachau camp was, that was built for 5,000 held 30,442 men in the main camp. As prisoners were rotated out to gas chambers or permanent work locations, others were rotated in. 
prisoners in branch camps around Dachau accounted for another 37,000. So around this camp, they had other camps, smaller camps of other prisoners. The numbers on this slide tell it all. Estimates vary from different resources, but these are generally acknowledged to be the most accurate. From 1933 to 1940, before war was declared by the Allies, total number of prisoners at Dachau were approximately 37,575. Once war was declared, the total number of prisoners from 1940 to 1945 was about 161,944. The butchery at Dachau began with arriving trains. As an example, on July 5, 1944, when a train arrived, supposedly bringing 2,582 Frenchmen, but only 952 living and 483 dead arrived. The other dead had already been unloaded somewhere on the way. The SS claimed the prisoners fought among themselves and trampled each other. Within Dachau, Nazi doctors experimented with prisoners for a variety of reasons. Dr. Rasher and Professor Schilling used prisoners as guinea pigs, practiced experiments in biochemical, malaria, tuberculosis, high pressure exposure, high altitude using a decompression chamber. And that's right here. New medications and bleeding tests. Body temperatures were dropped by freezing techniques, which is right here. <clears throat> then rapidly raised to see what limits German fighter pilots could tolerate. The patients always died by testing the limits. Throughout the Nazi concentration camps, over 7,000 prisoners were subjected to inhumane and horrendous medical experiments in an attempt to seek out evidence to further their radical racial ideology to a better supposed Aryan race. Next to the crematorium at Dachau, the camp leaders required a gas chamber to be built. It was begun in 1942, but as a result of willful sabotage by the prisoner laborers, it was not completed until 1945. It contained an undressing room, a shower bath, and a mortuary. The showers of the bathroom were, in reality, metal traps for the supply of poison gas. This gas chamber, however, was never used in action at Dachau. Only the dead were brought to the crematorium for the burning, not the living for the gassing. As was mentioned before, Dachau prisoners who were sentenced for gassing were sent to Austria aboard special transports called invalid transports. And in 1942 to 1944 alone, this accounted for 3,166 persons. There were few incidents at Dachau, however, supported by eyewitnesses, where individual prisoners and small groups were gassed using poison gas pellets. pellets. The Dachau concentration camp was liberated on Sunday, April 29, 1945, by elements of the U.S. 7th Army, the 42nd Rainbow and 45th Thunderbird Infantry Divisions. The 20th Armored Division support, provided support the liberation included the main Dachau camp and 123 other subcamps and factories. No Americans were killed or injured during the liberation. The American liberators, liber, liberators made sure that residents of Dachau and other towns were forced to confront the horrors of the concentration camps. In the town, in the town of Dachau, a group of Nazi elite was forced to tour the, uh, the Dachau crematorium on May 8th 1945. They were, they were made to look at the naked, emancipated, emancipated bodies of the innocent victims of Nazi bar barbarity, piled up in the mortuary room right next to the gas chamber. Young boys in the Hitler Youth were brought to the camp and forced to look at the corpses on the, de on the death train. And even today, young school children and servicemen in the German army are required to visit Dachau to learn of all the atrocities that happened there. According to an eyewitness, a, a few of the Dachau notables who were forced to view the corpses fainted. Some cried and many shook their heads. Most of them turned away, eager to avoid the scene. There was a typhus epidemic in the, in the camp, 
but the Dachau townspeople were not sprayed with DDT to kill the lice that spreads the typhus, and they were not vaccinated before being taken inside the camp to be exposed to the disease. A film made during the visit of the Dachau citizens to the concentration camp was included in the movie called Death Mills. The movie was part of the re-education program for the German people who were made to feel personally responsible for what happened in all the camps. The U.S. Army Commandant of the town, after the liberation of, the, of Dachau, spoke angrily to a group of 30 Dachau town leaders the day they were brought to see the camp. And he told them, quote, as punishment for the brutality that the town tolerated next door to it, the town should be sacked and turned into ashes. A local priest begged on his knees to save the town, and the town was not destroyed. The lesson on the citizens of Dachau was not lost forever. The Americans forced the Dachau women to clean up the boxcars of the death train. Hopefully we're gonna lighten this up a little bit. These are the pictures that I took, or had taken, uh, when I was there. Uh, yeah, that's me with still the young figure and the dark hair, right? <laughs> In shape. <laughs> and uh, you'll notice that normal MPs we didn't wear the, the white hats and the full uniform with all the braids and anything because if a prisoner got a hold of you, he would have the upper hand. Okay, as I mentioned to you earlier, I wanted you to remember that one building. As you go into the camp, now these are the pictures I took, which were, for all intents and purposes, illegal. They said we could not take any pictures. And because we were there on a hush-hush basis, even the Germans didn't know we were behind the museum. The, the stockade that was used here was for American prisoners who would just go AWOL or disrespect an officer or maybe come in late from the weekend and the company would throw them in the jail just to give them a taste of what jail was like and then pull them out and then they, they kind of straightened out. But this here is a road that I walked on. It's actually this bridge right here. This, this bridge is right here. You can see the machine gun Nest. This is the camp. This is part of the base. And this is obviously a river that goes through it. But this right here is a camp. And I took that picture as I was on this bridge right here. This building was the building that housed the SS officers. Okay? That's where they stayed. And that's the building I pointed out in an earlier picture that was taken off the internet. This wall right here with all the writing on it, I know you can't read it. And I don't exactly remember what it said, but there's four different languages. As you walk in that front gate that says work makes you free, this is what you walk into right here. And it has the wording in English that this will never happen again. I asked you to remember that picture a while back. If you look at this picture here, I took that picture. It's the same thing. The sculpture on the front, part of that's the museum right there. The, the stockade is behind it. That's why we were not seen, okay? That's why we couldn't talk about it. But that sculpture right there, right here, is a picture of bodies that are going all kinds of ways, just like what they found when they liberated the camp. Okay, and all this, you know, the skinny bodies and no, no flesh and everything, and that's what they built to remind people of what, was, what happened there. And that's me right here. <laughs> you can see that, I was 19 years old, taken in front of all that, and that's the museum right there. This is part of the camp, looking at that monument, which is this right here, is right there. And that's another angle of looking at the camp from the outside. That's a picture of me there as well, nice and thin and in shape. This is uh, the camp right there, and if you were caught in this area here, that was a picture of me taken with the machine gun nest right up here at the camp being right there. If you were caught in this area here, this is the killing zone. You can see this, is, uh, this goes outside the camp. This is inside the camp. But if you were caught in here and somehow you got in there, it was over. The machine gun nest right there. This is the picture I wanted to tell you about uh, that I took. I guess this is when we were open, 51st Military Police. I was getting ready to go inside. Right here, this is what we call Sally Port. Sally Port. That's the front gate entrance. The guard shack is right here, and here's the stockade, okay, here's the museum. They didn't know we were back there. 
The world didn't know we were back there. Okay? So as I was walking, right here is the front, front entrance right there. I'm trying not to shake. <laughs> it was right there. That's the front entrance. The stockade is about 200 yards long. Very, very, very long. And as I was coming out the front gate, or the front entrance, I took this picture, walking towards the front gate. That's the front gate, here's the front gate. I just reversed it. And I had the camera, like right here, around my waist, and I went, click, so no one could see me. But I wanted, all the American prisoners are in their cells right here. We used the same stockade that Hitler used in World War II. That's why, you know, when I asked where am I going, they, they wouldn't tell me. Here's a picture of the crematorium inside the camp. Well, it goes off to the left. Here's the inside of the barracks. They kind of redid it a little bit, and this is where the people stayed. And normally, uh, it was uh, designed to hold about four or 500 people per uh, building, and they, they squeezed thousands in there. You, you had no privacy or comfort. And the whipping table, this is the actual one they used. I got a picture of it. It was inside the museum. That's the actual one that they used with the whip right there. That's as close as I could get to it. Okay, you'll notice on this picture here, see the arrows? I did that purposely with a pen. This is the wall. This is, that's the ceiling. That's a gas chamber. That's the one that was never used, the one that was sabotaged. I was inside of it. I stood there and I, what the hell happened here? You know, try to envision what happened here? And that was never used, but I got a picture of it. This is the actual ovens that they found, or I mean when they liberated the camp, it was left as is. So I got a picture of that. These pictures here are inside the museum, and they're on the wall. So I took a picture of a picture, and that's why you see the flash right here. But you can see thousands of prisoners that were killed and what they were like, dressed like, and up here as well. This is the front gate. As you come in from the front entrance uh, to the stockade, this is the first gate you go through. Here are some other pictures. You see, these are all the cells. You can just see how old it is and how dilapidated it is, and it's crumbling and falling apart. And there's, there's gates every so often, so you really can't move along there unless someone lets you through the gates. It was, we were very well guarded. We guarded very well. This is a picture of maximum security. You can see the gates are different to the, each cell. This right here is a picture of where the health and uh, comfort area was, like your toothpaste and razor blades and so forth. It was right behind that gate. But I will tell you just very, very quickly, 10 days before I got to this unit, keep in mind 10 days before I got there, there was a shipment of American prisoners from the Mannheim stockade. And we got the word that they were badasses, and pardon my French, but they were bad people. And they were gonna take over. That's the word we got. So one by one, they led them from the mess hall to maximum security right through here, through the door, and there were guards waiting for each one of them to beat the living hell out of them. Never knew what hit them. They used rubber hoses. That got out eventually. We made the front page of Stars and Stripes. Congress came over, members of Congress, to investigate us. And as a result, the major, uh, sergeant, and a couple guards were court-martialed. And then they closed down the unit. See this door right here? That's the entrance where I came in. You can see I'm the only one in there from the front gate, Sally Port. You can see that the stockade was starting to close down. We took down all our signs. This is the museum. And right here was the mess hall that I mentioned where they brought the American prisoners out. One by one, let them across this compound to maximum security over here, and that's where they jumped them. Anyhow, you can see how long that stockade is. That's the main entrance where the major would come in every morning. And then it goes on even beyond that, another couple hundred yards. But here's what I want to point out to you. This is cell number 60. This is the inside of that cell. You see you have small windows. Supposedly, when I was on the night shift, <coughs> supposedly there was a woman who was killed in that cell. An American, or not American, but a, a dissident of World War II, or, or I mean, uh, yeah, during that time. 
She was killed in that cell. The American prisoner that was in that cell practically tore down this door to get out because he said he saw her. She was there. Uh, if you believe in that kind of thing, you know, she was there. She was, I don't know, harassing him, torturing him. He was so scared. He almost took down the whole wall right here because to get out, he wanted out. He would not go back in. Whether or not that happened, I don't know. I, I really don't. But this is the inside of that cell. And again, this is the front gate that I was on with full, full military, you know, being armed to the hilt with 45, a rifle, baton, you name it, we had it. And then again, this is after the stockade closed. Okay, as I mentioned in my readings that they did experiments, the German doctors did experiments on people and animals and whatever they could find to test, you know, what they were looking for. This is the very end of the stockade. This is way down at that end, way at the other end. This is the very end. You see that door? That was the door leading down to where they did the experiments. It was sealed permanently for life. That's the door. And so during the summer, when we would work there, uh, when the Americans liberated the camp, it was so bad down there, they just flooded it. They did not even go down there to take everything out. They just flooded it for what they saw. They just flooded. And during the summer months, when it was hot, that stench would come up from down there. And you could smell it. This is the back side of the stockade. There's the museum. And again, that's the back side. And that is just another picture of that. This wall right here goes out into the community. When the stockade closed down, we caught two guys from England who came over that wall. They were almost shot. We had them down at gunpoint. And they, you know, they moved. They, they had it. You know, what are you doing here kind of thing. <clears throat> well, we heard the stockade. Well, you're not supposed to be here. So we caught them, and we had them on the ground at gunpoint. That's a machine gun pillbox. That's where they had machine guns. So if anybody got out back here and got over this fence and through here, there was a machine gun waiting for you. And last but not least, this is a statue dedicated to all those who died at Dachau. It's right outside the town, right? And this right here, if you can, can't read that, but I'll tell you, it's a grave of many thousands unknown that I happen to take, and that's the cross, of course. But they're all buried under there, and that's just another monument to, to all of them. So there you have it, folks. That's my experience. I'll never forget it. Chance to really see it as it was. I can see why they didn't tell me where I was going. When I, <laughs> when I, I, they just wouldn't, it was very secret duty. <clears throat> but I think I was compelled here to let everybody know what I saw. <clears throat> you know, because when I, when I talked at, at the Memorial Day Parade, obviously I didn't say a lot about this. I couldn't because of the younger crowd. But I'm really, really honored to be here tonight to at least get an opportunity to explain all of you and show you what was going on. And we have a few minutes. Are there any questions for me? I'll, I'll do my best to answer them. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Yeah. But, and he's going to know. Um, first, I want to thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I'm from Kansas City. Okay. And I was just about the token Gentile and would babysit a couple. The first thing I noticed on their arms, they were numbered. Right. And they did not want to talk to me with their children around. This was when I was in high school, the 50s. But my mom came over and they were talking. And I kind of eavesdropped. And a lot of what you said, I remember them saying. Really? It's very vivid. Oh. And people used to tell me, oh, that didn't happen. Really? Did everyone hear that? She was from Kansas City, and, and her yeah. family members knew people that would talk about this, exactly what I was saying. And some of them were saying it never happened. Yeah, but some other she, people told me she it knows. Never yeah. And I'd really like to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I served the uh, same time as you did, so. My questions are strictly during the time you were here, not about the German operation of the facility. That was uh, quite a large stockade. Was it a central confinement facility? Okay, the question was, are we a central confinement facility? Yes, we were. Absolutely. So did 
for the entire Germany or Europe? Because that is a huge stop. No, that was the first one that was ever established. So it was central in that area. But that's the first one that was established by, the, by Hitler and his men. No, no. I'm oh, talking about I'm sorry. Strictly your time there, your time, and you say your military police. Right operated this as a confinement facility Correct. for U.S. forces. Correct. Yes. So were you a central confinement facility for Germany or all of Europe? No, 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 we weren't. We, what was the largest number of uh, American prisoners? U.S. troops who had confined it for You know, that would fluctuate every day. We, we would have somewhere between 75 to 100. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> That's because back then, in the 60s, you know, they didn't take any BS from anybody, the officers and what have you. And you were late coming in from the weekend. You got thrown in jail. You were disrespectful to an officer. You got thrown in jail. I mean, it's not as lenient as it is today. But uh, that would fluctuate. Then the companies would come and take them out. Then we'd get new prisoners in, company comes, take them out. So, so just army, you were just army. Oh no, we we had all we had everybody. Air Force? We even had officers. We had officers in there, too. We had one officer who was uh, charged with murder. But I mean, but <coughs> can find other services. Yes. Or just army. No, any any one of the branches. Any one. Of yes, sir. But it was just the one barracks, right? You mean for the for the constant for you had oh yeah we just had one barracks yeah, yeah we just had one barracks for the for the guards yeah what's sorry I misunderstood there today? I'm sorry what's happening there today <clears throat> well everything is still there everything is still there and as I mentioned the German kids and the soldiers have to go through there and it's it's the world wants Germany to get rid of it the world will not let it the world will not allow anything to happen to that camp. Yes, sir, Dave. But there's no army unit there now. No, it's completely closed down. Right, it's completely. Yes, sir. That was, that was 50 years ago that you were there. Have you ever considered going back, or do you know anything about its status now? Um, the only thing I can tell you, I know it's still there. I, I would like to go back, but, uh, you know, that's on the bucket list. <laughs> so, Dave. You were allowed contact with the townspeople, Doctor. No. Did no. They, know you were there? they did not know we were there. No, we were not allowed to even go into the camp in the uniform, okay. because it was that sensitive. Even though we were Americans, okay. <clears throat> it was that sensitive. How did they treat you as an American, even if you were out of uniform? Uh, they treated us pretty well. They really did. Um, but you know, it's just a sensitive time in an area. They treated us pretty good once we told them who we were, but we didn't go out of our way to tell them who we were. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, you say you're sensitive and you didn't want the town folks to know that uh, the <coughs> operation was taking place. How were you able to move U.S. prisoners from the outside into the camp without the locals knowing what's going on? Well, they knew they knew that the camp was there, obviously. We had a back road. There was a back road where the prisoners were brought into the front gate. But only at night? No, all the time. But it was a back road that was, you know, kind of out of the way and, and not, you know, not very well known, what I can remember. In marked vehicles or uh, plane well, No, they were marked vehicles. Marked they, yeah. Mm -hmm. U.S. Mm -hmm. identification. Yeah. <clears throat> I wouldn't think a lot of locals would want to go hang out around the concentration no. camp to see what was going on. No, there, it's, it's still, I mean, if you watch some of the movies that are out, even the documentaries on uh, National Geographic and history, after the, after the camp was liberated, you know, they brought the women in from Dachau to clean it up, and they were just appalled at what they saw. You know, and they wept and they cried, and how did this happen in our town? And, and they're kind of upset today, from what I'm understanding, because Dachau is known for this. And people want, you know, they, they want people to come to see Dachau without remembering this. They want, to, they want everybody to see the town and what it's about, and not because there's a concentration camp there. <clears throat> Mike? I'm, I'm curious, and if, if you don't want to answer this, I understand, but do you have any idea why when, 
why you were selected for this? Is this just fate that you were selected for this assignment, or were you had a certain set of skills that made you perfect for this assignment, or do you know? Yeah, I was a badass. I was a no, no. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. I, uh, I'm sorry. Sometimes my life. I'm being honest. That's the answer you're on record. Oh, you can edit that out. Uh, no, because I'm a big guy. And I was in shape, and I had a, you know the MP background and training, and they just you did you, you request it in no any way, or you just they said hey you just do what you're told get in the truck and we're, here's where we're going and here's where we're going right but we all were MPs, and that's why I kept saying where are we going yeah. you'll know when you get there where are we going no you'll know when you get there and boy did I find out when we got there yes ma'am how long were you actually stationed thirteen months. 13 months, and I am a firm believer, a very firm believer in a divine intervention as to why I didn't go to Vietnam. Because I went in during the Tet Offensive of 68, when everybody was going. How, they said to me, Ray, you're going to Germany. How did that happen? Well, here it is right here, a chance to talk in front of all of you, being the captain of the Honor Guard and leading the Honor Guard for other veterans that are being, you know, that passed away that are being interred to be there for them. I'm a firm believer. And my pastor from my church is sitting right there. So I have to behave and I have to say that. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I have to behave, especially when I'm helping them with communion. So uh, yeah, I, I'm a firm believer that there was a reason why I didn't go to Vietnam. And I, I feel guilty. There are times I, Dave Taylor back there is the commander of our post and I, I told them I feel guilty at times. Sure, everybody was going. I didn't go. So I don't know why. You, you go where you're told. You go where you're told. You don't say why. So, um, Dave, would you like to come up and you want to do that? This, this is Dave Taylor. He's the uh, he's retired colonel of Special Forces, U.S. Army. He's also the commander of our American Legion post. And I have to keep him in check. <laughs> uh, Ray told you at the end uh, there were two American divisions, infantry divisions, that liberated Dachau. I thought it's rather interesting because I just came back from Oklahoma City for my Army Division uh, Association. We do a reunion every year. This year was in Oklahoma City. And one of the places we went to was the 45th Infantry Division Museum. It was a National Guard unit in Oklahoma. And the 45th was one of the organizations that liberated Dachau. So the 45th was called the Rock of Anzio, or the Thunderbird Division. The other was the 42nd, was called the Rainbow Division. And it's very interesting, those of you that are in the military, particularly the Army, will chuckle at this. There were bunches of divisions heading down from the Northwest towards Munich, and Dachau, all parallel in line, because there was still a war going on, and Germans were putting up a fight. This 45th Division, the Thunderbird Division, <coughs> came down, if you remember the picture of the concentration camp, they came down where the, all the barracks were, and all the guards and everything. So they were lined up, it was a, uh, a reinforced battalion, they were lined up for battle against the Nazis to protect the, the camp. Okay, so that's what they did. The other one, the Rainbow Division, had a very small contingent, and they happened to come in. They went out the other way in the front door. And they had just a small contingent of an officer and, and some enlisted guys, and a German officer came out of the front door with a white flag, and he surrendered to them. So they got the credit for liberating Dachau, <laughs> <laughs> while these guys were loaded for bear to, to do it. So uh, it's, it's all good stuff now. but. Uh, Anyway, I had to get this book uh, for Ray, and uh, the 13th chapter is all about the liberation of Dachau. And you probably need a glass of wine to get through it. Very, very interesting. But anyway, I bought this book for Ray. More than one. The, yeah, more than one. Or more than one. <laughs> and um, the curator of the whole uh, division associate, and I told him about Ray doing this presentation. So he signed it. And I'm going to present it to Ray. It's to Ray Hewitt. Thank you for your presentation on Dachau. Keep the memory alive. And it's signed by the guy in 45th Infantry Division Museum Curator. 
And so this is yours, Ray. Thanks, Dave. And here's here's okay. a little thing about the museum. So it was you. quite an interesting read. And I wish they had one section of the museum as a small room with some chairs, <coughs> and they had a video, an oral history video of soldiers that were actually there liberating Dachau and what they saw, what they remembered. <coughs> And it was just, you just stood there, and, and there were pictures all over the place. Some of the pictures you saw in race. And you just listened. You just listened. It's like, oh, my God. So I went to the, the uh, souvenir counter <coughs> to see if they sold that video. And they did not. But it, was, it really was just hit you right in the face with listening to these people, what they saw when they came into that town. And they just couldn't believe it. Here's the back. Yes, sir. Um, I noticed that a lot of times when I'm driving on US 42 in Lodi, that there is a sign over next to the side of the road saying um, Memorial Highway for the 42nd Rainbow Division. Is that right? Is there some significance why that is on US 42 in Lodi? Dave, I, I, I don't know. I don't know the, um, the 83rd Division came out of Ohio, so I don't know where the 42nd, 40 out of uh, Oklahoma, I don't know where the, unless somebody was in the 42nd and said Route 42, and he had some money way back when, and they dedicated it, it's probably, I'm not sure, that's a good question, I'm not sure where the 42nd Division came from. Anyone else, any other questions? Well, first of all, I can't thank you enough for taking time to be here tonight. Uh, I am uh, deeply honored. I had a chance to talk about this. What I saw, I was 19 when I took all these pictures. In shape, dark hair. Um, you know. Huh? Now you're blonde. Now I'm blonde, yeah. But thank you very much. I know there are many, out here, many of you out here that have stories to tell. And I want to thank you for letting me have the opportunity to tell my story. Uh, I'm really honored for all, and thank you. So. Great. Oh. No, I, sh I should have done this before the book. I, I don't want to follow. I didn't want to follow that. But this sm small token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate, I appreciate it. it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. I, that's it. I, unless somebody has another question, I can answer. It was so interesting. I mean, it brought back so many memories of what I lived through. I know it's it's yeah it's nice. different. You can tell I'm still done. Uh, absolutely, yeah it's it's yeah, yeah the like the writing on the one wall that I showed you when you first walk in. It, it, this will never happen again. Never will happen. Yes, sir. Were you related to Rush? You went to school. No, no, no relation at all. I'm not, I'm not related to anyone in Seville. I'm not related to anyone like even the Stan Hewitt Hall. I wish, but uh, <laughs> but I'm not related there. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm, go after the. Uh, uh, after the stockade closed down, I was reassigned to the uh, Frankfurt Stockade, the 50th Military Police Detachment. And uh, we were not well liked in Germany. And you know, don't get the idea that uh, it was easy duty, because it was not. Even in Frankfurt, because of Nixon's movements in Vietnam, you know, they took it out on us. And there were many times, I, I, I lived in the barracks, that we had our a whole post surrounded by a, a big brick wall. And any time Nixon would make a move, we were surrounded by German nationalists. We had a deuce and a quarter truck we would put at the front gate so they couldn't get in. And I was up on the roof of the buildings, full ride gear with direct orders, direct orders. Anybody comes over that wall, you take them out. Full ride gear with an M14 aimed at anybody who would come. And I thank God to this day I never had to do that. But the, we were under direct, and you followed orders. You did. You followed orders. You just don't say no like they do today. But Dave. Yeah, it's an important to understand, and he was there in 68. This was the late 60s, so the anti-war movement was at its zenith. And uh, that, the Europeans were all against the war, made it very tough on soldiers over there. And frankly, there was a lot of disrespect among soldiers. Half of them didn't want to be in the army at the time. Right. Because, you know, they get... They get this anti-war thing, and then they get drafted, and and so that's one of the reasons why his unit had who they had. They had some bad guys that just did not want to have anything to do with the army. Tough, tough time to be in the army. 
Yeah, and even going down the street, walking down the street of Frankfurt, uh, I saw a lot of bullet holes in the walls from the war went through Frankfurt. Uh, but uh, they knew who the Americans were by your haircut. And you really had to be careful because they jumped you out of, out of nowhere. Yes, ma'am. I was traveling in Europe in the summers of 67 and 68. Oh. There was general anti-American. Oh, yeah. General. Yeah, all the way across the board. It was. I was not in Germany at all, but in France, oh, my God. Yeah, they did. So, you know, it, it was tough everywhere, and you really had to be careful. But I tell you, I went up, up on that roof with a rifle and bayonet, a baton, 45, full ride gear. Take them out. They come over that wall, you take them out. That's the way it was, folks. So, anyway. Yes, sir. In the wee hours of this morning, I happened to be watching a movie on TV, and it was about, I'm not, I may not have the name right, Eichmann? Eichmann. Eichmann? Eichmann. It was kind of his story of his participation, and I'm sure it was Hollywoodized. I'm sure. Nonetheless. Brutal. He was something else. He was the guy, according to the movie, he was the guy that came up with the idea that we'll cremate all the bodies so that they, the world can't dig up the bodies and exhume them and, and uh, find out who they were. We, we got to cremate them. Well, where you get the labor for? Well, we use the prisoners to, to do all that work, et cetera, et cetera. He was just something else. Well, they, they tried to burn everything before the Americans liberated the camp, and then you can see there's grave of thousands unknown, which I had the honor of taking a picture. Yes, sir. Yeah, you mentioned Eichmann. I don't know if it's still in the movies, the Regal Cinema, but two weeks ago, there was a, there was a movie in, what was the name of it? Anybody remember? Util or something like that. But it was about... Ben Kingsley was the guy who was yes. playing... Yeah, but it was about the uh, Israeli Mossad, or CIA, and the true story of how they went down to Argentina okay. and got Eichmann. The final operation of the yeah, like the final, yeah. It was fascinating. And the thing is, another bad actor in this was Joseph Mengele. Uh -oh. Mengele was a doctor, and he did the most, I think he was at Auschwitz, and he did the most terrible experiments, and he had a fetish for twins. So he would gather all the twins. He was combining. He'd change their eyeballs and the whole nine thing to see what, you know, and all this stuff. <coughs> I, Mengele got down to Argentina as well. And as you see in the movie, Mossad, when they were there, they, they found out where Eichmann was, so they started planning how they would grab him. And then they found out that Mengele was there too, and they, they didn't get to him. But they, they said, our mission is to get Eichmann. So they had to leave Mengele there. They knew where he was, but they had to get Eichmann out, and that's how they did it. And then eventually Mengele died. Folks, I'm going to leave you one last comment that I forgot to tell you about. Once everything closed down, you know, I told you I was the only one in the middle of that stockade. I swore, as God is my witness, I heard somebody come walking towards me. I flew out of there. I mean, I ran, and I, there was barbed wire on the front by the door, and I just flew over that and rolled. And I just <laughs> I tailed it back to the gate, because I swore I heard footsteps, and you don't, just don't know. But we had this captain come in. He was a really cool dude, really cool guy. And so a couple, three of us actually got under, we went back to the stockade, we actually got under the first floor a little bit. We found newspapers from 1948 and cigarette packs. I don't know how they got there, but we managed to get, we did not get all the way down to the, we didn't want to get that far where they, they, they just sealed everything off. But we managed to get under that first floor area, it's kind of hard to describe, but we found stuff, you know, and the, the captain went right along with us. He was just a cool guy. He really was. So he was interested too. So, but then after that, the whole, the whole unit just went everywhere because of what happened to those other prisoners when they beat them up coming in, and the the mail was monitored so they wouldn't get out, but somehow it got out. We made the front page of the Stars and Stripes. Go figure. And Congress sent over an investigating committee. Congress because of the area, and so, so that's that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Uh, so. I, again, no, folks, thank you. Thank you very, very much. So, all right.